Hello, hello, how's everybody doing? I hope everyone's well, staying healthy, and of course, nice and calm as we inch clumsily towards some degree of normality. I hope everyone's doing well. My name's Christian Byrne. I'm a rapid transformational therapist and resilience coach, and I'm extending a big warm welcome to the second episode of Agents of Calm which is my series of live interviews that aims to capture the thoughts, ideas, and stories of people who in their own unique way are helping the people in and around their communities or in their job get clear, facilitate balance, and raise consciousness, which of course are the three things that I like to suggest are the three pillars of living and being with greater calm in today's world. I am super, super, super stoked this evening to be joined by my guest, Mark Wilkinson. Um, with Mark's permission, I'm flouting tradition a little bit, and I'm going to allow Mark to introduce himself simply because of the breadth of his story and how deep we're going to go into that this evening. But safe to say, I've known Mark longer than he knows I've known him, which sounds like I'm a stalker, but I'm not. But we'll get into that a little bit later on. But we reconnected recently. And it turns out that our journeys have been quite similar and we've got a lot of the same things that we can share. So, so stick around for this evening. We're going to be talking about things like the power of resilience, the importance of making balance a priority in our lives, not just now, but at all times. And what it really means to be raising our own individual consciousness during, uh, during these unprecedented times of change. So without further ado, I want to welcome Mark. How are you doing? Hey, Christian. I'm good. Thanks, mate. How are you? Very good, mate. Thank you very much indeed for taking your time to join us this evening. So, um, as I suggested, why don't, um, like I said, I know it, it sort of uh, flouts tradition, really. I'm supposed to be you know, <laughs> the host and do do the introduction. But I think, why don't you just give us all a little bit background about who you are and, and, and your journey and, and we can run it from there. Sure. I mean, thank you, first and foremost, for inviting me on, mate. I think this is a great idea and I love it. I love the fact we can reach more people and talk about yeah. you know, things that are going to help others, which is ultimately the name of the game. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, obviously, my name's Mark. Uh, I was a uh, resident DJ at Ministry of Sound when I was 25. Um, I uh, travelled all over the globe uh, DJing for 15, 20 years almost. Um, yeah. I, uh Travelled to 65 different countries. I had a record in the top 10 doing a remix of uh, Lou Reed and David Bowie, Satellite of Love, in 2004. Um, I, um, yeah. That was, I just, that was you? That was me, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, 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 what did you produce that under? Satellite of Love, Dab Hands remix, yeah. Oh, my yeah. God, there you go. There you go. See, I, I, I've, I've hidden behind quite a few productions. Some of that is to do with the fact that I wasn't a particularly confident young chap. Right. Uh, I hid okay. my, my name on records. I didn't put my name out there. I was like, I was hid behind a production moniker. And it was, uh, yeah. it was an interesting uh, part of the journey, that one as well. But yeah, so there's a lot of records I made that people probably wouldn't even know that I was involved in, but I made them. And uh, well, Satellite know, of Love was a classic, mate. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know that. So I'm, there you, you know, go. amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. See, you've got a, there's not a string to the bow. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, and uh, you know, life was great fun. Um, you know, I had a party that lasted you know fifteen plus years. Um, you know, uh, but then something weird happened. Something really, really strange happened. Um, it was two thousand and three. Uh, I was in my central London flat up in Marylebone. I'd, I'd um, sold my house and uh, moved into Marylebone Marylebone because I wanted to. I wanted to live the full on DJ lifestyle. You know, you know, five minutes from my house from any nightclub. Yeah, dangerous, yeah, dangerous. dangerous. Um, but uh, it was it was amazing. I, I was well, really pleased. That I was living there. It was great fun. I was living with my brother. Um, and then uh, one afternoon, after a particularly heavy evening, um, I was walking back into my uh, into my living room, uh, <coughs> carrying a tray of food. And as I was walking into the living room, um, for inexplicably, for no reason, nothing you know like this had ever happened before. Um, my my right leg just just buckled and just gave way completely beneath me. Um, and, um, you know, the, the tray went flying and I just literally sort of, you know, went down to the side and I'm six foot four, uh, you know, I'm quite a big lad, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. um, and I, um, I basically crashed really, you know, down into the, onto the floor against the wall and down the floor. Um, and I just, I just lay there, uh, and I was in absolute agony, like the, the back of my right leg all the way down from like the, you know top of my right leg um all the way down my leg was just felt like a red hot poker it felt like someone had just 
stabbed me. I can't, you know, I can't even really explain it, but it was just horrible. Right. Um, and I just lay on the floor and it was just, I, I just couldn't believe what had happened. That was just a really obviously strange experience. And, and um, I lay there and, and I couldn't move. I couldn't get back up. Um, you know, the leg was just sort of shivering and, and, and shaking, but it was just it was so painful. Um, and uh, my brother was there. My brother was in the in the living room, and he he thought he thought I was messing about. I think I think he thought I, you know. And he was he was like, "Are you all right?" You know, because he was over the other side of the sofa. You know, he was like, "You all right?" And I was just like, "I oh, know I'm not." And he he jumped up and he came over and he he picked me up off the floor and moved me to the sofa and sat me yeah, up, yeah. Laid, laid me down. And I was just I was shocked to be honest. I was really shocked. And it was. You know, it, it was a start. It was the start of something very, very strange that happened. That I basically lost. Um, uh, I lost a lot of weight very, very quickly. I became very skinny, and I, I, my body froze. Every joint in my body froze up, and I yeah. couldn't move properly for about eighteen months. It was. Oh wow! I, couldn't, I, so could, what, hardly, I could hardly walk. What was the diagnosis? Well, no, no. This is part of the problem. Nobody could diagnose. No, nobody could diagnose it at all i went to i was living just off harley street in marylebone so i didn't have a gp and i went yeah. i went to just about every expensive doctor you can find to try and find out what was going on because i it literally you couldn't touch my hand my hand felt like it was on fire my shoulders i was swollen you know there was it was pain everywhere i was taking painkillers every like two or three hours sometimes even less um Gosh, this sounds so, so familiar but we'll get on to that in a minute <laughs> so, i couldn't sleep at night it felt like someone was stabbing me in the ribs yeah um, it was just awful. It was really awful. And it was 18 months of absolute agony and, and hellish stuff, really. So you've got, you couldn't DJ through this. So that was your whole music career on hold, right? Well, yeah, essentially, yeah. I, I could barely get out. Some A lot of the DJ gigs that I had in London at that time were regulars. So yeah. actually, I was a bit like, I don't know if you remember Val Dunica, but I was, I was, they, put, they, give me a, they give me a seat. They give me a seat. Yeah. Oh, they give me a little seat and I DJ there, like playing records, you know. Did you, wear, did you wear a white polo neck as well? <laughs> <laughs> but I was sitting there and I, I, honestly, I was like, I was decrepit, and and um, it was it was very very difficult to survive it um, financially, um, and it did lead eventually to me end up being bankrupt as well in my thirties, which oh, which did not, did not you know it was not a good thing, you know. The two of the worst things I could you know imagine and mm. two of the worst things that you know i would never wish them on anybody you know incurable disease and bankruptcy it, i ended up being diagnosed after 18 months with a uh, incurable rheumatic condition called ankylosing spondylitis um it's so imagine, flared, that on, imagine that on the scrabble board crikey <laughs> it's, it's flared up once recently in the last five years or so as well but again when i was under a lot of stress um right. and, I've, I've, the whole book situation, I, the whole Life Remix book is something that I've been thinking about writing for 10 years. And it's finally come together now uh, because, you know, I have got a message. I've done so much self-development, so much learning, so much understanding of what happened, mm. why it happened, and then what I've done to fix it. Brilliant. Uh, and, and, you know, long story short, you know, just to get rid of the headline, long story short, I went from unable to walk for 18 months. I ran four marathons, London, three London mm. and a Berlin. Amazing. And then I've gone from the bankruptcy to basically a net worth of over a million pounds with property portfolios, businesses. And I've done that by just getting myself together and understanding my role in the whole kind of play of life. And, and the whole story is in the book, to be fair. And it, it's just... It's just something I want to share. It's something I've needed to share for a while, and I mm. believe it can help people. And that's ultimately what I want to do. So that, so that whole sort of control or delete moment that you had in your life, which is something that I also had, that that pretty much has been the catalyst for doing what you do now. I mean, it was at the platform for you to then sort of move forward because you're still you're still involved in music to a certain degree, aren't you? Yeah, I, you know, music used to be a hundred percent of my life. I used to live it, breathe it. I, I used to like, play records, make records dance all night long you know I, that was yeah. it percent of my life and I, I never I didn't I committed to it fully I didn't do anything else mm. um you know and so in some ways that was a mistake uh mm. you know if I'd have had other assets or other streams of income or other things I wouldn't have ended, ended up in a bankrupt situation when when the music uh, industry went went down and uh, the credit crunch came in 2008 mm. I would that wouldn't have happened but the point is is that I still love music it's about five percent of my life now yeah uh, but I've got I've got ten businesses that are all running successfully with lots of other things that are going on all the Brilliant. time. 
Today, I've been on non-stop video calls talking to people all over the world. Um, I coach people. I'm a business coach. I've got a construction consultancy. I've got music. I've got loads of different things. The book, you know, all yeah. of this great stuff. And I've, I've planned it all over the last 10 years to make myself, if you like, crisis proof or recession proof to be able yeah. to, to be able to go through any situation. And it's actually, it's, you know, the hard work that I've done is being, is being, uh, shown right now because you know well, that's, what's well, interesting about that is that's incredibly relevant for you know what we're talking about and what people are going through right now i mean that like everyone's in their own it is a, i mean it's a massive crisis for a lot of people um so do you so so do you think have you got have you what was the biggest learning that then you took from that experience is there a couple of things that you took out from that that you can pinpoint like that's why this happened is there kind of yeah. a, linchpin, a linchpin insight that you can yeah. You can take forward. Yeah. Oh, there's so many. There's loads. So I'm going to try and yeah. just pick a couple. Um, yeah. the, the one that got me for health, the one that, the one that really kind of the, the light bulb moment for health mm. was uh, when I watched The Secret for the first time. Mm. Uh, Bob Proctor was on there, the older guy with the grey mm. hair. Yeah, Bob, yeah. Bob Proctor was on there. And he, for some reason, he, was, he, he spoke to me. All the other characters were all great on there. They're lovely people. But mm. Bob somehow just, it's almost like he was like my dad, you know what I mean? He was just in yeah. that dad mode. And, and he just he, he just said a disease is two words. And I yeah. was like, I was like, what? I was like, you know, mm. what are you talking about? Uh, he said a disease is two words. You must hyphenate it. And I was mm. like, right, okay. <laughs> and um, I hadn't heard that before. No one had ever told me that before. I didn't understand it. I didn't have a clue what he was talking about. Mm. Um, so then he, then he said he followed it up by saying, um, "You cannot have a disease if you are at ease." And yeah. The, the words, yeah. Are there. all the words are there. You cannot have a disease if you're mm. at ease. Mm. So if your body's in a healthy emotional state. Mm. You won't have any disease. Yeah. And I, I, I was kind of like, what? Uh, and, uh, you know, but that really kind of opened my eyes. And and then when I went to see a doctor with all this aching and pain and uh, you know mm. and everything else. He said to me, oh, unlucky, you've got an incurable disease. Yeah. Take these Help, drugs. Helpful. helpful. Yeah. Brilliant. He said, take these drugs. <laughs> yeah. The, take these drugs for the rest of your life and you'll, you know, you should be able to be all right. And I was like, right, okay. Thanks very much. Because I took them, because that was a short-term thing just for me to go, mm. right, I need to find out what's going on here. Mm. Because he's told me I've got a disease, and mm. Bob tells, tells me then that I'm not at ease. Yeah. I thought I was fine. Yeah. I thought everything. Yeah. I was a DJ running around the globe, you know, doing all that. And I thought everything was all right. And then my body basically gave up and said, no, it's not all right. Mate. Yeah. So that was a big one. Yeah. Uh, the other one, the other, the other real stuff that, that got me actually was um, uh, I made a video about it recently on the, I've just done the Life Remix YouTube video um, last week uh, and uh, put a video up there about the seven negative emotions versus the seven positive emotions. Mm -hmm. And that was a real beauty because yeah. Understood about the seven. This and this comes from Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, which Brilliant is a book. Brilliant book. Yeah. So yeah. Sitting, sitting here on my desk somewhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Signed signed by Bob Proctor. I've got it here. Um, um, he um, uh, he says in there about the seven negatives and the seven positives, and about obviously trying. You know, he studied five hundred millionaires for twenty five years, mm. and it's information into that book. So I think there's some good info in that book. Yeah, yeah. And you do too, clearly. Um, yeah. I read it and he said that people who made millions and did really well in their lives and were comfortable and enjoyed their wealth and everything else, they always lived in the seven positive emotions. They never dwelled in the seven negative. Um, and it was a real eye opener that for me because I was like, well, actually, if I look at this list of seven negatives, mm. I was brought up in most of those. Yeah. Fear, oh, that, oh, that was your, that was your upbringing. Yeah, well, fear, doubt, worry, anger. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was just this list and I was just like, Oh God, you know, you know, bless them. My mum and dad, they loved me and they did everything they possibly could from all the knowledge that they had at that time. Mm. But that list was so relevant. It was like, Oh my God, I've spent nearly all my life in that, in that list. So those, so those emotions will be, you were sort of learned, learned those emotions from your family around you growing up. Yeah. My dad came back from the world war, came back from world war two. He was 50 when I was born in 1970. Okay. I died when I was 18. Uh, in right. Um, and, and that was rough in itself. But he, I think he had PTSD when he came back yeah. from the Second World War. He, two, mm. two of his brothers were killed. Mm. You think of saving Private Ryan, but they didn't send a squad to save him, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And, uh, and so he was, um, 
I think he had PTSD and he, he was very anxious and worried. And he, you know, it was a tragic, it was a tragic story, my dad, really. Mm. Uh, and, um, and my mum also, my dad, my dad was 50, my mum was 25. Go, Dad. Uh, anyway, so uh, the point is, is that, uh, you know, they, they both did their best, but they just didn't know enough. And so I was brought up in this lack mentality, this fear, this doubt, this worry. We have never got enough. We're going to lose the house. It's all going to be terrible, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right? And guess what? I started drinking alcohol at 14. I started yeah. taking drugs at 16, 17, 18. I started to, I got on planes to escape the madness. I just shot off, but I was in, I was, you know, in Singapore or China or America or wherever playing music and traveling around the globe. I created that, that life. So up, so up here, so up here, sort of consciously, you're out there having a great life doing music, but down here subconsciously, there's a programming going on, which is just avoid the pain, avoid the pain. And I think it's so interesting because for me, that's really when we talk about raise consciousness, the number one thing, um, when I'm working with clients on that, it's about becoming, living back in the body, becoming embodied again, because it's so easy as children to become disembodied, to live out of the body, to live in like in our minds, live out of play, live externally. And that's got even worse now with technology. We literally live through technology, through apps and phones and other people's lives through Instagram. And now there's TikTok and things like that. And it's something that, you know, I think about quite a lot, but it sounds like you're a classic example of that as a child, that very quickly you learned that it was easier to live outside of the body because it was just too painful to live in it and um, a lot of the stuff we a lot of the stuff you just said and and you know music you know even mm. football you know i'm a f huge football fan but it's yeah. all you know it, it's a distraction yeah it's all a distraction now it, you know mm. I, I used to use it as a distraction, but not not conscious of it. You know, mm. I do all this stuff to try and just avoid how I felt and avoid mm. my family situation, all that kind of stuff. Mm. And actually, you know, one of the best things that that came out of it all was the fact that I realised that you know all of that stuff is entertainment. Yeah, and great entertainment, and we enjoy mm. it as long as you enjoy it as entertainment. And keep it in that bucket. Yeah, exactly. You know, so the football's on; it's entertainment. Yeah. We enjoy it. I'm up and down, mm. and this and that. It's fun. You know, music is entertainment. I love mm. it. It's but it's not the real depth of the soul. It's not the real kind of no. like inner, you know, the, the subtext of the book is uh, mm. inner turmoil to inner peace. Yeah, um, yeah. Love it. I, was, I was I was in utter turmoil for like well, for 30, probably about 37 or 38 years, to be honest. Um, yeah. It's only in the last sort of uh, 10, 10, 11 years that I've actually discovered inner calm. Bob Proctor said, I've studied a lot with Bob, and Bob Proctor said, your way isn't working, try mine. And I yeah. was bankrupt. No money, signing on 10, mm. 11 years ago, and I thought, all right, fine. I, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll do what you I'll do what you say. And you went all in, exactly. You I, went all I, in, I, yeah. I, if it doesn't work, it won't. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and I'll just accept it, and that'll be it. Yeah. But, oh, my God, it, it works. <laughs> it's amazing. My life, yeah. my life now is, is, yeah, wonderful. Brilliant, brilliant. So tell us a little bit more about Life Remix then, because it's more than just – because you're obviously the book. When's the book coming out? Uh, I was talking with a publisher today. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we've got a couple of publishers that are interested, so I'm just mm -hmm. deciding what best to do with with that. Um, you know, it's just as easy these days to self-publish, to be honest. Yeah, of course, uh, of course. Yeah. You know, at the, at the end of the day, uh, you know, a, a bigger a bigger publisher could certainly put you on a, a bigger stage. Let's put it that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. And my, the, reason, the reason and the mission for doing this book is because I want to be able to help people. I yeah. think I'll particularly be able to reach people that have these kind of maybe addictive tendencies, yeah. uh, they can, they, they've lost their way some way or there's a crisis on the horizon or they're going through one mm. uh, you know, or they want to avoid a crisis. I, I, in all honesty, that that what I just said applies to just about the entire population. Yeah, but yeah, you know, exactly. In all, honesty, in all honesty, I believe that I can help. I can help a lot of individuals. I, I do a lot of coaching already um, yeah. and, and I love it. It's amazing. I love helping people. I love seeing people go from something that maybe is not exactly what they want to take them to you know, something that is really, really where they want to be. Is there a focus around your coaching? Do you focus on a particular type of person with a particular like problem or are you just there to lend your experience as it applies to them? The actual coaching I do is a business coaching with a guy called Kevin Green, which is, is phenomenal. Yeah. But yeah. so much of that is on is on mindset as well because if you're going to be successful in business, you've got to have the right mindset. Yeah, absolutely. Life remix, life remix coaching is personal development. It's, it's purely personal development. Mm. And it's something that we do um, because we believe we can help more more people. I did mm. 15 years of of personal development before I could ever be ready to to understand Kevin's business messages. You know, so yeah. 
it, if you go into business too quickly with the wrong emotions and the wrong, you know, the, the wrong sort of programming, you could end up being, you know, unsuccessful and causing mm. yourself pain. But if you do a lot of work on yourself first mm. and then mm. get into business, then you can actually be really, really successful. Yeah. So, but to be honest, you know, I, I believe that there's, there's, there's teenage guys out there of addiction that are doing, you know, I was drinking at 14, you know, there's, mm. there's, there's, there's people out there, there's, there's particularly young people in construction, for instance, I do a lot of work in construction. There's young lads that are committing suicide and stuff like that. You know, I believe that I can reach a lot more people through this book, mm. and then be able to take myself out even further uh, yeah. and, and extend that help. And yeah. Extend, yeah. I'm coming from a place of uh, I want to help other people avoid some of the pains I've been through. And I want people actually to, to <clears throat> enjoy their lives. You know, there's parts of my life that have been phenomenal. Mm. absolutely phenomenal utter joy right now right now is, is utter joy yeah. i've created it because i've moved away from all the negativity that i was caught up uh before mm. um it's it's something that you have to work on it's something that you can develop but mm. it's there it's there for every single individual it's not just for me it's not just for you it's, it's for anybody and is that is that the impact that you're really wanting to have from life remix is that really what the message is absolutely yeah the message yeah. the message is um Okay, so so you asked me earlier about something that kind of you know uh, sort of moved me, and I mentioned about the disease and everything else. Something yeah. else, uh, every personal development coach I've ever spoken to or heard from mm. always says to me, "What is your purpose?" Yeah, what is your purpose. Another way of saying it is, "What is your why?" What's yeah, the- exactly. Yeah, the deep was, why. Yeah, and I was like, "Well, I, I don't know. I play a few records." You know? <laughs> <I play laughs> Make few- the people laugh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, I play a few songs and people yeah. cheer. And it's like, woo, you know. And, and, and that was kind of it. And and um, and then people kept asking me, you know, what's your purpose? I, I, was, I don't know. And then out of nowhere, and, and it is exactly what you say it is. You decide what it is for you. Mm. I, I ended up talking at a um, student's uh, uh, midi school, Manchester midi school, to music students mm. uh, via Ben from Paper Recordings. We made some albums for them and, and we went up there and I gave a talk to these students. Uh, and um, at the end of it, about six of them, of the 20 or so, they all, the six of them stayed behind and shook my hand and said, thank you so much. That was amazing. Uh, I really enjoyed hearing about your journey. I really want to, you know, emulate that. I want to follow it. I was like, I got the same feeling. I got exactly the same feeling in my soul and in my, you know, goosebumps. I got the same feeling from those students saying thank you to me that as I did from playing to like a thousand people at Pastoral Ministry of Sound, I got that same vibe, that same buzz, that same uplift. And I was so that, like, yeah, I was like, right, my purpose is to bring joy to people. That's it. And, you know, and that's lovely, isn't it? Because I think everybody, I think you're so right. A lot of people, like when I came out of doing um, my rapid transformational therapist course and I was combined with my coaching, there's a lot of pressure from people on like, you know, what's your why? What's your purpose? What's your niche? And, I, you know, a lot of people come out of there and they just want to help everyone. Now, I know from a business perspective, you, you know, the more you can focus, the easier it is to market yourself and build a, a specialization around certain things but i think it comes to a point where if you don't have a clear niche it can be quite exhausting and in itself can become a real block for people and i went through that a lot and to your point um i needed to discover what was my meta what was my sort of archetype and yours was bringing joy it doesn't matter whether uh, you're playing records or whether you're on stage talking or doing your coaching there's actually a really wonderful um and this is for anyone listening if you're interested in getting to some really beautiful podcasting there's a lady called jocelyn Jocelyn Gly, I think her name is. And she does this podcast called Hurry Slowly. Okay. And one of her episodes is absolutely brilliant. One of her episodes is called Who Are You When You're Not Doing? And it was basically this, this talking about, you know, who are you when you're not being the DJ, the coach, uh, the consultant? You know, who is the, you know, and it, it's it, it was it's a really, it's quite troubling to listen to because it, it really forces you to think in a way that you probably haven't thought before. But to your point, you know, whether whether you're on stage doing your coaching, you're doing your talks, whether you're DJing, your archetype, your why is just joy, inspiring, so inspiration and joy. That's you right. Know? There's a bit more to it because I thought mm. it can't just be joy. Joy mm. is, you know, joy is great. You want to bring joy to everything mm. in every situation, but it's got to be a bit more. It's got to be. Mm. I was like, right, okay, well, I like reading. I like studying. I've got all my favorite books here. Mm. Knowledge, right, okay. So joy, knowledge, mm. inspiration. I love to inspire people mm. and create. I want to create stuff. Yeah. So now, excuse me. So now, all I do is I create my life on purpose. Yeah. So my purpose is written up in my in one of my office uh, uh, doors upstairs. 
to bring joy, knowledge, inspire, and create. And as long as I'm doing those four things at any moment in the 16 or 17 hours I'm awake, as mm. long as I'm doing one of those four things, mm. my purpose is I'm, I'm fulfilled, I'm happy. So yeah. I, can, I can be working on any one of my 10 businesses, but I'm working on those four things. Yeah. If you want to sit here and complain mm. and go down a pub and moan about everything and all that kind of stuff, mm. I, would, I would try and help, but if mm. I could that conversation i would have to excuse myself and leave mm. i wouldn't be bringing joy or knowledge or inspiration or creation mm. that is so important because now i just bounce out of bed i'm like right what we're gonna do today and here's the thing we we're talking about resilience before we came live i mean for me resilience is about three three fundamental things and the first one is exactly what you've described it's about commitment um and that's a lot of the work that i do as a coach i have a program called calm which stands for clarity alignment leadership momentum and it's helping people get clear. What are those? Th what are those things that you can write on your wall, and mm. you can get so aligned with? And when I mean by alignment, it's getting so you've got absolutely no uh, emotional, mental blocks between what you want and what those things are. You know, th there's no blocks in terms of achieving them, and you're just and you're just so lit up when you think about them that it's effortless to get out of bed. That's the reason you get out. Because once you can get to there and you have that depth of commitment, nothing can get in your way. Doesn't matter what life throws at you because you've just got that complete focus. And the other two are control and, and competence, but that that you know that that's a separate conversation. Well, I, so love what a, I love what you've done there, mate, and I think yeah. that's fantastic. And, and the bottom line is, is you, you've articulated you've articulated it in a really good way. <coughs> it's mm. so important. <coughs> excuse me. When I get up now, mm. you know, I just enjoy every moment of every day because I'm living on purpose. Yeah. There's nothing you can stop me. I'm not doing I'm not doing life remix because I want to earn a million pounds. I'm doing life remix because I want to help a lot of people. And then the money and the money, you know, and then naturally the abundance and prosperity will follow. Exactly. Money comes because you're giving great service. Yeah. You can give great yeah. service to a great amount of people. You think about Steve Jobs from Apple who create and, and um, Bill Gates who created computers. Yeah. They, created, they, they they're you know multi billionaires or whatever because they created something that actually allows us to to yeah. be able to communicate like this is great service to a lot of people. And, and that's how you earn money. That's simple as that. Yeah, exactly. So what, what advice would you have now, mate? For because obviously the world is is going is in a in a in, in an extraordinary, unprecedented period of uncertainty and change and transformation. And you know, and I think like we live, you know, the fundamental <laughs> law of the universe is polarity. On the one hand, it's very troubling and, and difficult and painful, for, but on the other hand, there's there's a lot of opportunity and there's, you know, if, if, if you've got the right mindset, um, what would be the advice sort of top three things you, you'd advise people on right now, regardless of where they are? I mean, you know, coming out of this as we sort of start to navigate our way to whatever, you know, the new normal will be based on your experience. What advice would you have for people? Um, well, in every crisis, there is an opportunity. Mm. Uh, that is an absolute fact. The two, the three, you know, two incurable diseases, you know, and one um, and one bankruptcy for me, those were mm. actually things that became, you know, have become the best opportunities for me. Mm. They've made me rethink. They've made me change the way I was thinking. They've made me get my head around a few different things and look for some help, to be fair, and yeah. find out from some other really, you know, intelligent, you know, Tony Robbins, Bob Proctor, Kevin Green, mm. you know, The Secret, lots of, you know, really interesting stuff. Um, uh, in fact, as well, you know, something like um, relationships as well. When I had relationship crisis, I had loads of those when I was young because I, I couldn't get one to last. Um, and uh, I reached out for some more information there. And I read a book called The Way of the Superior Man by David Dieter. You know, in every crisis, there's an opportunity. So yeah. in this crisis room right now, you know, I know a couple of people that have got like less than a few, you know, a few hundred pounds in their bank account. Yeah. They're applying for universal credit and they're just, you know, just about getting through they've got enough money to clinging on yeah they've got some money to buy some food and they've got a, a roof over their head because they can't be evicted at this current stage but they've got mm. no work and it's you know that's a really tough situation to be in but it's an opportunity mm. it's an opportunity to understand where you're going to go from here now mm. you asked me you asked me about three things well the first thing the very very first thing to do with any in any crisis at any moment and to be fair pretty much in any moment of your entire life is acceptance. Yeah. Accept what's going on. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Accept, accept what is happening. Accept what has happened. Yeah. And totally accept it. Yeah. Totally accept that that has happened. You know. And then the second thing is take responsibility. Now, 
A lot of people won't want to take responsibility for a global crisis, and quite understandably. But my yeah. point is, if you take responsibility for absolutely every result you've ever had in your life, including if you've only got a few hundred quid in your bank account or whatever it is, but take responsibility for that. Yeah. Understand it's a product. That is a product that shows how you were living. Yeah. You can change that now. Yeah. We all have a choice. Yeah. You have to exercise your choice. Yeah. Change it right now. Mm. So accept what's happened. Take responsibility for everything. Mm. And it's tough. It's really tough. Some of the easiest ways to do acceptance, particularly, is just to forgive. Forgive everyone everything. Stop blaming it. You know, there's no need. You, you're not going to get anywhere if you blame people. Yeah. You've got to take ultimate responsibility. Yeah. He said to me once, responsibility is the key to freedom. And at yeah. the time, at the time, I was like, what are you talking about? I spent most of my life trying to avoid responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> running, exactly. around, running around the globe playing records. I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't call that particularly responsible. Um, but, um, you know, responsibility being the key to freedom, I was like, right, I didn't really get it. But now I get it. I completely get it. Mm. I'm, I am totally responsible for so many things. Um, but it, I'm driven. I'm so driven. So I would say acceptance, responsibility, and then dust yourself off and mm. start planning. Yeah. Start planning. Use the opportunity. Use the fact that the world's not going mad and people aren't ringing you all the time, you know, and – yeah. Well, in my case, they are still ringing me all the time. I'm about three times as busy as I was before the lockdown, but that's another story. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, acceptance and responsibility and then plan for your future. Now, are you, you know, do you think that this is all you're worth to humanity or could you do more? How mm. can you do more? Write it down. What things are your purpose? What things are you passionate about? You know, mm. Start to design yourself and start to design your, your perfect life because, in the space of 10 years, I know 10 years seems like a long time, but it's not, you know, but in the space of 10 years, I've gone from bankrupt to being in a wonderful, comfortable situation and mm. still growing and still developing and still doing more. And that's happened yeah. because I planned it. Bob yeah. Proctor said, set a goal. When, you, when I was bankrupt, Bob Proctor said, set a goal that seems so big that when you achieve it, you'll know it's because of what I was telling you. Yeah. And I said, right, okay, I've got no concept of how I'm going to do it. But I'm gonna I'm gonna earn four hundred pounds a day, which is two thousand pounds a week, which is eight thousand two hundred pounds or eight thousand three hundred pounds a month, which is one hundred four thousand pounds a year. I said I'm gonna do that. I'm bankrupt. I haven't got a job. I'm an out of work DJ. I don't know what to do, but I will earn that money. Within three years, just over three years, I was earning that money. Brilliant, brilliant. So, because you planned. I just planned. I just planned it. I just designed it. I said I didn't even understand what I was going to do, but I ended up doing a couple of qualifications and ended mm. up. I actually ended up working in construction, and my first construction job was on the Olympic Stadium. Mm. I was the health and safety manager of the Olympic wow. Stadium. You know, trust me, there's there's more in this book. It's it's been a roller coaster ride, but you know, I went from um, I went from uh, the, the Olympic Stadium to Heathrow Airport, and then to uh, a large. We bumped into each other at Heathrow, didn't we? That time. Yeah, so yeah. I remember it well, mate. So, um, the message, so the message I'm taking from there is, is I mean, I mean, the one thing I would throw in, because I love the way you said acceptance, because for me, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, it, you know, for me, my my ground, my kind of ground zero was obviously when I was diagnosed with with cancer in 2013, and I was lying in a hospital bed on the first morning, and lost. I literally within 24 hours went from what most people consider as a dream life. You know, in Dubai, just, you know, I was DJing as well. I was running an advertising agency, tax-free money. I just married, you know, the girl I've been waiting for my entire life. And we're literally within 24 hours, most of that had just been taken away from me. I couldn't walk and I was staring, you know, I was staring death in the face. I remember having this moment of clarity going, it, my mind wasn't acceptance is, and this is the advice I give to people, but it's the same thing. You've got to learn, no matter how hard it is, you've got to learn to be present with what's going on just be present right don't don't lament the past the regrets the the shoulds coulds words don't project into an unknown future that you have absolutely no control over just be present with what's going on right because you have a choice you can respond with great fear or you can respond with great love that's your only two choices when your back's against the wall like you were or we're like a lot of people are, you've got two choices. You've got fear or you've got love. Now, I know love, some people might choke on that word, right? Because it's, you know, for all the reasons that we don't need to go into. But when I talk about love is you can respond with gratitude, with opportunity, with self-compassion, 
with belief and 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 eventually if you do that over a day and it was hard you know because when you're sitting there in hospital and you're you know it's terrified you know um you eventually it starts to just chip away and you just start you know this you start to sort of have your own reservoirs of determination and confidence and belief and you know when those things when you go downstream with those types of emotions you become unstoppable which sounds like exactly what you did but the key what i wanted to say is the key to yours is take action mm. don't don't there's this great article i'd read recently by a guy called james clear it's like there's a big difference of being in motion and being in action and a lot of people get stuck in being in motion right and i'm the i used to be the king of that in motion is plan plan study that guy take his notes do this i'm going to do that this is my strategy here are my goals da, da, da. but there's a difference then you've got to take action you've got to show up and taking action is, is just making that definitive action towards what you want you know and that's where you've got to break through your fear break through your courage and go for it so great advice so within three years you went from on your back nothing to earning what 100 grand, you know, 100 grand a year brilliant yeah. Yeah. What, what, was your, what was your breakthrough on that uh well funny enough i i, I w with the bankruptcy um i was kind of stuck i was a bit like right okay i've got no work i'm an out of work dj what am i gonna do yeah. um in a guy that i've been talking to uh, in thailand he's got a friend basically a friend of a friend been talking to him online and i i was thinking about going over there for a bit for a holiday and he said um you know i've got a, a radio station don't you and i was like have you he said, yeah, I've got an FM radio station in, in Thailand. If we can, I went, oh, yeah. He, <laughs> he said, do you want to come over for a year and play play music? I went, is, is this Gecko? Um, no, 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 it's not. It's a, a friend of mine, unfortunately, who's died now. He's lovely, lovely man. He's married to, married to a Thai woman, two beautiful kids. Um, Steve, Steve, uh, Steve Jordan, what, what a guy, what a guy. Mm. Um, he, uh, yeah, he, he invited me over there and... Um, I said, yeah, all right, yeah, I'm up for that. I'll go, I, you know, I've got nothing going on here. I'll go to Thailand for a year. And I went and over there and I DJed for, a, yeah, just about a year on, on uh, FM radio, uh, Phuket Island Radio, 91.5. Mm -hmm. And I did it. And what it did was it just cleared my mind completely. Mm -hmm. uh, but I ended up uh, meeting a, a, a girl, a woman called Lisa, who, um, uh, Lisa English girl, and her husband, Mark, they lived in, in Phuket. And uh, they knew me from back in the day, a bit like your intro. No, they knew me. I didn't really know them, but they knew me. Yeah. That's and, the link. Yeah, I said I'd do that. I didn't. Yeah, that. yeah, and um, and so um, they uh, Mark was. They were living in this beautiful house, this bigger house. And I said, "Well, how have you done that? Because you were dive instructors, you know." And he said, "No, no, I, I work on the oil rigs. You know, I work on oil rigs. I do construction and health and safety on the oil rigs." And mm. I was like, "And Mark's a great lad, but mm. he's no more intelligent than I am. He's just yeah. that I do my life to music." So anyway, I just I said, "Yeah, okay." So he told me what to do. I came back. I did the exams. I did a few exams. As it turns out, you know, here we are, like you know, ten years later. I'm now uh, I've got a master's um, in leadership and management. I'm a chartered member of the health and safety of IOSH, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm going to study a PhD next because wow. I want to call me Doctor Wilkinson. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal, Doctor Wilkinson. <laughs> I'm going to do a PhD next because you know it'll take time, but I want to do it because every time I do more qualifications, I just I just seem to get more confident. It's a thing for me. Yeah. Uh, but the book, the book is is um, is a big piece of work. So I won't be doing a PhD for a while because I've got this book to do, and then obviously yeah. to go and talk about it. But you know, my, my ultimate purpose is to help as many people as possible, and and you know, uh, you know that that is a, a a positive thing to do with your life. No, uh, totally, totally. And it, you know, it gives me so much joy and so much satisfaction. And ultimately, by you asking me to come on here and do this show with you, you've I, I'm grateful to you because you've helped me live my purpose tonight by bringing some joy to us, you know, sharing a bit yeah. of knowledge, inspiring well, yeah. uh, and in creating something, you know, it's great. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, thank you for that. And listen, I must get, just going back to the book, mate, give me some writing tips. So I, 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 I finished half my book. So I'm writing a book about my experience, just like you. Um, and um, I, I just, I've got halfway through it. Any tips, you know, anything that you've learned about getting that momentum going and just, you know, getting it done right so first of all ask me how many times i've written my book <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay uh, basically yeah i've basically this is probably about the fourth attempt at it uh, i've tried i've tried it lots of different times and i got exactly stuck where you were uh, mm. because i just kind of lost i just lost where i was going with it it just wasn't mm. feeling right you know i'll be honest you know i'm not a, i'm not a fat boy slim superstar dj you know people doesn't don't want to read my biography but I might be able to help them with a story. So that's where I was coming from. That's where I, that's where I am coming from. Um, so 
I've worked with a book mentor, which has been really, really helpful, actually. Oh, okay. Good one. Okay. And that's been really helpful. Been really yeah. helpful. Will Foster, top, top, top fella, published on Hay House, lovely guy. Um, so, but he made a quip because we were, I was, we were, I was working with him and we were doing some coaching and he was helping me because I believe in coaching. I am a coach, but I also believe in other coaches the way they can help me. Hmm. Uh, anyway. So so, that's, sorry, man, I'm going to jump in. That's so, in, so, so, so important. If there are any coaches or therapists watching this, um, you know, I, I, like from someone, I, I should heed my own advice. You know, just because we're good at coaching other people doesn't mean we're good at coaching. Everybody needs a coach. Oh, mate. Know, they really do, you know, and just it's the best coach. investment you'll ever make. It really is. I've got a wealth coach. Mm. Uh, I've got a, a, a book mentor coach. Um, I've got various business coaches around me. Um, I've got a, a PT, physical train, you know, personal trainer when the gym's open. You mm. know, I, I get people, other people motivate me. I motivate them, but other people motivate me. And it's a yeah. just one big, beautiful sort of cycle, you know. Anyway. Yeah. The book thing. So uh, my wife's called Emma uh, and uh, she was sitting there and uh, she was listening to me getting coached and we were talking about all this stuff. And she just sat there and she wrote, she wrote down a note and she said at the end of the call, she said, uh, Wilkes, that's what she calls me. She goes, Wilkes, she says, um, have you ever written a timeline for this book? I was like, no, nah, not really. Just kind of like, it's just sort of here, you know, here, there, everywhere. She said, um, she said, write a timeline, will you? And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> And I, so I sat down from 1970 when I was born mm. and I wrote down every time I could think of something. And this, this went on for a little while. This was like a process. If it wasn't like 20 minutes, it was like yeah, oh. yeah. But every time, you know, when you get those little things coming to your mind and you go, yeah. oh, I remember when that happened. Yeah. 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 So I, I populated this word document timeline, 1970, 1980, 1982, 1989, Acid House. Uh, you know, did it, I went through the whole thing and just I wrote it out. And then from there, I just, I just, it was so easy to plan it from there. Yeah. No, so that's every, a great insight. Great every, insight. Every chapter title in my book is, is a song. Yeah. So the, first chi- the first chapter title is Another One Bites the Dust by Queen because I told you about my collapse. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. The second chapter is Good Times by Chic because I was partying. It was good times. Uh, and the third chapter is Lost in Music because I definitely was by mm. Sister Ed. But I, I populated all of that. I, I started the timeline, and then it all just started to come together. I got some great quotes. I told a few stories, and this yeah. timeline just sort of grew and grew and grew into about a three-page word document. But really? that three-page word document, I could then break down into sections. And go right. That's chapter one. That's chapter two. That's chapter three. And and it, then it just became it just became quite easy. And I know that sounds. I know that pain. I've I've been struggling for ten years, so I know the pain of getting stuck and going, "Oh, writer's block." And what do I do here? And how? And and Will, Will, the book mentor, he said to me. He said, "I told him about this," and he said, he went, "Ah, oh. he goes, everybody needs an Emma." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was her. It was because he had the same experience. He had the same problem. It took him three years to write his book because he was up down here, there, and everywhere. She literally yeah. just. And said, right, get yourself organized, do that, 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 and that, right. and that. And I, yeah, and I went, yeah, exactly, yeah. Drop yeah, the drop mic. Nugget. Exactly. See, so they do know best, don't they? They do know well, best. You know what? The best relationships, the best relationships. I've read a lot on relationships. The mm. best relationships are relationships that complement each other. Mm. So mm. the things I'm really strong at, socializing, talking, you know, presenting, mm. all that, that's not her thing at all. Yeah. But the thing is organizing, logic, you know, getting things perfect detail you know that's what she does. i don't do detail she does loads of detail yeah and that relationship then becomes a massive you know complementary um love of one another because you 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 you, you know not complete each other that's cheesy but you know what i mean you actually yeah, yeah, i do i do i mean do you know what it's a nice it's a sort of a nice segue into into the this whole subject of balance which is something i'm really big on because i think it's one of the reasons that i got very sick and and it actually sort of underpinned a lot of the issues that i had in my in my younger life um you know, that they, they, is helping people understand the importance of prioritizing balance in your life, yeah. you know, because we're, you know, a lot of us are so out of balance and really when balance is simply is making sure that you've got, first of all, you understand yourself and what, what nourishes you as a person and you've got an abundance of all those things in equal measure and you're not being dominated by one thing or the other. I mean, just the, the two years before I got sick, I had zero balance whatsoever. All my life was just work. That was it. It was just it was just stress and work and build and make and consume and that was it and as a result you know there was I had no you know so so little else going on I you know my daughter was born two years before you know and I I 
I've got to be honest, I missed a lot of her early years because I was so consumed with that. So what, what, what does balance mean to you, mate? I mean, how have you found balance since, you know, over the last few years since you've been sort of yeah. rebuilding and remixing your life? But balance has been uh, has been hard to find, to be honest. Um, it's been really hard to find. I, I was always I was an all or nothing kind of guy. I still am a little bit, I suppose. I've just balanced it out nicely, you know. But I was an all or nothing kind of guy. I got into something and I was I'd go for it, you know. And, and that was the same with clubs and night, you know, nightclubs and music and whatever it was. I just I was, you know, you could call it passion, but you could call also call it like you know addiction almost. You know, it was almost like. Yeah personality you know i get into addictive relationships and all kinds of stuff you know um so balance is something that that um i had to work on myself mm. very very strongly I, I before you know well before i met emma you know i've been doing self-development for myself for about 15 mm. years since the collapse um you know i had to create the the person that i wanted to meet so i you know i used to meet a lot of like really highly emotional kind of like you know crazy partners and everything else and, and it's because i was like that so that we attracted each other yeah i did loads of work on balance i did loads of work on actually creating the the, the mark that i am today i wrote down i just literally wrote down all the qualities that i wanted to have even ones some that i had you know i did have some I always had a good heart i always wanted to help mm. all the work stuff so that was already there mm. i just added a few other things to that list and one of them was calm i mean i was never calm god i was mm, a, yeah I was like, right, I want to be calm. I want to be um, um, driven. I want to be successful, you know, properly successful. Mm. Uh, so all these things, I wrote them all down. And then I just worked out how to do it. And I, yeah. I read a lot of books, mate. I read a lot of books. I did mm. a lot of study. I watched DVDs and films and self development I mean, I, in, in some ways, I immersed myself in, in almost an addiction to personal development. But it was almost like being – it was a positive addiction. Yeah, yeah. A, Thing because every time I tried something or every time I studied something, I then tried it for myself and it worked. And exactly. I, went, I went, okay, well, I'm going to keep doing that then. You know, and it becomes self, it becomes self perpetuating. You're right. You're right. And and what advice would you have for people? Because I mean, obviously, they, you know, some of us, well, it's not getting lucky, but some of us just have a moment of wherewithal where we find I me. Mean, my personal development journey started just after I arrived in Dubai. I mean, I, I lived, I was completely unconscious pretty much for the first 29 years of my life i was just for various different reasons which we're going to now like you i found the i was lucky enough to be in the dance music subculture from the age of 16 and just went for it and i went for it because it was great and it was amazing and magical and i you know bouncing around to people like you at the age of 16 in maidenhead you know and going up to you know all these and, and it was you know it was fun but but it, it started then to become what I didn't realize a problem, it became an avoidance and a distraction from dealing the things I was dealing with. But it wasn't until I got to Dubai and I don't remember the exact moment, but I, I just had an awakening. You know, it wasn't a spiritual awakening, but it was an awakening going, there is another way and I need to find it. But um, not a lot of people have that. So, you know, what would your advice be other than sort of working from a coach? Well, you know, if, if someone was saying, look, I, I, I need to change and I need to sort of get a bit more aware, raise my consciousness, get some balance, where would you suggest people would start? The best thing to do, the absolute best thing to do, mm. is to find someone that you respect. Find that find someone you respect, you revere, <clears throat> someone mm -hmm. who is already living the way that you would like to live. Yeah. Okay. Find that person. It could just be a parent. It could be a grandparent. It could be a personal development coach. It could be a business coach. It could be a multimillionaire. It could be anyone. It could be anyone. But find someone who's already living the way you would like to live. Yeah. And then copy them. And I'll tell you something now. Every single one of them has written a book to tell you how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, they have. If, honestly, you know, if you want to copy someone who's been wildly successful, Richard Branson, Kevin Green, Robert Kiyosaki, mm. any of these yeah. people, Bob Proctor, Tony Robbins, they've all written books on how to do it. Yeah. And all you've got to do, I mean, I heard a great quote once that said that uh, someone over, so someone who won't read has no advantage over someone who can't read. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, that's pretty powerful. Yeah, um, nice. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I never, I didn't read a book from, I didn't read a book from leaving school or probably about 16, 17. I didn't read a book until I was probably in my mid 30s because I was yeah, too same. busy. I was too busy being a maniac running around the planet doing all this crazy stuff. No, exactly. But, and it was only when I, I, I had to dig deep. I had to, there was, you know, clearly what I'd been taught 
when I was younger wasn't going to make me into a successful, balanced, calm, loving yeah. individual. And I had to reinvent myself. And, you know, the opportunity to reinvent myself was presented <laughs> with an mm. disease and bankruptcy. That's how it came up. And that yeah. was the opportunity to go, I have to do something different. And the whole remix is what we do. That's what we do with a mute. That's what we do with a track. We mm. remix track we turn it into something different you know there's an original version we remix it and then we make it better or more current and we make it into something that could could work now could sell better you know that kind of stuff that's what we do with remixes and that's what i've done with a live remix i've just done that myself mm. and i've just written it all down <laughs> isn't, isn't it amazing how that remix is such an such an important metaphor for what everybody's going through right now Mm. Like each and every, because oh, you met my wife and I were having a conversation the other day, and there's a lot of stuff going around on social media, like, well, particularly on LinkedIn, like, how's the world going to be different when we go back to what? How's the, you know? So, well, I think that's the wrong question. I don't think the question is how the how's the world going to be different. It's like, how are you going to be different? Yeah. Right. You know, because you got to look at what everyone's achieved over the last sort of eight nine weeks. You know, all right, the government's provided a bit of financial support, but the government, you know, that they've done one percent of what everyone's really achieved. You know. Each and every one of us has, has stood up and homeschooled our children and found the courage to continue doing our jobs or pivot into a new career or get fit. No, no one else has done that. You've done that. So the question is, is forget, you know, the, you know, the world does need to change, but it starts with each and every single one of us. It comes back to your story. You know, I mean, I'm a great believer that all of the traumas and the sort of the woundings that we've been through in terms of our body and our souls and stuff, they're preparation initiations for the unfoldment of our of our sort of gifts coming through, and I think you're a, you're a great example of that. And and uh, you know I, that's kind of what I wish for a lot of my clients is like let's find out what the lessons are that you've learned and what you've been through, and how can we turn them into your magic? How can we turn them into your fire? Because that's your gift. Um, yeah. So I mean, that, that's so 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 basically went off on a tangent then. So basically, find find someone you find a mentor, find someone you respect, and just you know do what they do just just borrow from them try stuff on if it works run with it and just keep doing that until you find your own rhythm until you find your own way they call it modeling yeah it's yeah a, yeah it's a word for copy yeah, yeah. And yeah. Even if you just copy someone else who's already doing what what you would like to do or living the way that you would like to live because they, they mm -hmm. will tell you they will share it with you yeah. um, you know, I just got one thing there about we were talking, you know, about the secret and the law of attraction and stuff like that. Very pivotal thing that changed for me. Um, when you were in the night, when you're in nightclubs and you're running around the world and that's the way you're living, doesn't it just feel like everybody's doing it? Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Everyone's doing that. Everyone's running around in nightclubs and doing all this crazy stuff that I was doing. Well, guess what? They weren't. Yeah. But mm. it felt like it was because we were all doing it. We felt like we were all doing it, but it wasn't. You know, there was. Yeah, really yeah people that weren't doing it it was just a small group of people that were doing it but it yeah. felt the world was doing it so you create you create you 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 create your reality mm. so the world will have changed when we come out of this because the reality is many many people have been affected by this crisis that would have been sailing through a crisis i'm going to use my wife again in, in this in this instance she has never been through a big personal crisis she's never understood you know she she works with me but she's never understood my my take on that kind of crisis because yeah. me not her She's got an event business was turning over a large sum of money every year. Within two months, it's gone. Yeah, in this, it's gone for this year. Right, this year off, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. She completely reinvented herself and and started a new business with web design and logo design and helping small businesses. Amazing, so, amazing. But she's done that herself. Obviously, she's she's married to a coach, right? So I pushed her down. <laughs> but the bottom line is, is that you know. She's faced this crisis and she's coming out the other side in a completely different way, in a mm. way that she, she's much happier with. Yeah. 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 Crisis is an opportunity. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's, it's absolutely wonderful that this kind of thing has happened. Now, I'm not suggesting that, you know, that it's a wonderful crisis. I'm just saying on an individual basis, you can take yeah. what's happened to you and turn it around into something new that you'll be much happier with if for the next 10 years. But while you're doing that, prepare for the next crisis because there will be another one. Mm. One in yeah. 2008, we're having one now in 2020. There's going to be another one, all right? Yeah. At least yeah. 10 years, there'll be another. Whatever it will be, there'll be another. So exactly. be for that one. And be mindful of that, exactly. Mate, amazing. Great stuff. Well, is it, just before we wrap up then, mate, is it, well, how would um, if people want to follow up with you or, or interested in buying the book, how can they uh, – I've, um, I've put your group URL up here. 
um, if people want to take a screenshot and join, you know, Mark's live remix group is brilliant. He's sharing stuff every day, videos, and he's got a great group going on there. But how else might people get in touch with you? Yeah, so we've got the live remix group, as you say. Um, mm. I've also started a live remix uh, YouTube channel. Mm. Uh, we're putting videos up, uh, you know, different videos in the group and, and different offers in the group and different things for, for people to, to get their heads around. But the YouTube videos there as well, which I'm really enjoying just getting that moving. Um, but um, yeah, look, we've got lots of different social medias. We've got, uh, you know, it's, these days it's easy to get in touch with people. You know, uh, you know, all you've got to do is uh, put search in, you know, put Life Remixed into the search. You'll find me, put Mark Wilkinson, you'll find me as well. Um, okay. The Life Remixed uh, banner that you can see on the top of the screen there, you'll see that everywhere. That's part of the front cover of the book. Um, and we're here to help. We're here to help. We're here to help people grow and move from a, a life of, you know that, that maybe they're not that happy about to a life that they can be really really pleased with and, and you know we're, we're not here for a long time so mate, know, exactly when would now be a good time to get on with it exactly exactly well mate from one agent of a calm to another thank you very much indeed for your time i've i may i've really enjoyed chatting i hope everyone else has enjoyed that as well um if you're on the live or you've been on the live thank you so much for dropping by and if you're on the replay, give us some love. You've got any questions for me or Mark, just drop them in the comments and I can pass them on to him or I can get back to you. But yeah, so that's it. That's that's episode two. Thank you all for dropping by, Mark. All the best, mate. I'm sure we'll be in touch, but stay well, stay safe. Keep doing what you're doing. It's amazing. And um, you know what? Let's see what the next few weeks brings for everybody. But for now, all the best. And uh, yeah, I'll chat real soon. You're Take a care. You're a gentleman, mate. Thanks and keep up the great work. Cheers, buddy. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.